Please stand for the words of our King. Our Gospel this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 2 through 11. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to, to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have kept leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the, gospel, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes. No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So far our text. Please be seated. My fellow forgiven children of the king. If someone asks you for your identification, that's not necessarily a pleasant experience, is it? Can I see your ID, ma'am? Sir? And you kind of frantically look for it. Maybe you have to dig it out from underneath the gum and you hand it to the guy. But maybe, just maybe the circumstances are different. You're about to go to a show and the tickets are at will call. And you walk up and they say, sir, can I see your ID? You have that thing ready to go. You've warmed it up in your palm and you slide it under the window to get those tickets, right? And then you grab your tickets and run on in. Showing your identification is not necessarily a bad thing, is it? And so if someone asks you, well, I think you're ready to show them. This season of Advent, we have been going forward under the theme, Come Lord Jesus. And we like to do so um, thinking about the different ways that Jesus has come as our King, as our Judge, and today we're going to see him as our Messiah. It's a Hebrew word that means Savior. And he is, in fact, our Savior. So, we say, show me your ID. We're going to see who is Jesus. Who is John? Finally, who are you? There are a few extenuating circumstances in the, just the first few words of our text when John, who was in prison, right there, that, okay, wait a second, he was the happy hippie guy hanging out by the Jordan River who didn't always sound so happy, right? He's eating honey-covered locusts, a delicacy, I'm sure. He's covered in camel hair, and he just told people to repent or else the axe is at the root of the tree. We hit that hard last week, right? And now this week, he's in jail. Well, this is where you get to hear not the whole story, but a little bit of the rest of the story. Mark 6, 17 and following, for Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, which she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled. Did he like to listen to him? Well, that's not how the story ends. I'll let you read the rest of the gory details in Mark chapter 6. But, and we'll get to John in a second, but let's finish off verse 2. 
When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now that's what some people might say a bad question. There's some debate about this question because it's questioning if Jesus is the Messiah. And yet I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with questions. The important part is where you go for the answer. Keep that in mind as we enter this discussion. And let's start from the standpoint that there's no way that John the Baptist could ever doubt that Jesus is the Savior. John the Baptist is the one who pointed to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John is the one who sent his disciples to go after Jesus. John's job was the herald of God. John baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. He heard the voice of the Father thunder. He saw the dove sink down on Jesus' head. We're going to talk about this in January. John was there. Well, how could John not know? Of course he knew. He's doing this for his disciples. Because someone, I just read this thought this morning. Why did John have disciples? <laughs> what are they doing? Do you think they just kept on visiting him in prison? And he's like, guys, listen, he's out there. Go follow him. And they're like, I don't know. That's what gets us to the other half of this, right? Let's say that you are John. You're having a bad day because that's your view. You're in prison. And you heard Isaiah. He'll come with vengeance, with divine retribution. Everything changes, right? Did it? Did things get fantastic? When Jesus came the first time, there wasn't really a lot of outward political change, was there, at all? I know that was frustrating for many. That's still frustrating for people today. And if you want more evidence, John came in the spirit and power of Elijah. That was the guy who was to come, right? We covered that last Sunday. Well, Elijah called down fire and the prophets of Baal. Everyone chanted, the Lord, he is God. And then the next day, Elijah's running for his life into the desert, finds a tree, sits down under it, and says, Lord, take me now. I can't do this anymore. I'm really good with thinking. John was having a bad day, and he wondered, what are we doing here? This isn't how I thought it was going to go. When you read Isaiah in that first, that very first lesson that we had, you have that pro prophetic perspective. You have both comings all mashed into one. And Jesus did cause great change. He is the Messiah. And the only difference from the people that I sit down with who ask me questions like this and me is that I got to spend eight years sitting in a classroom listening to every question you could ever imagine being asked. And even then I got here and I'm like, I don't even know that one. That's a really good question. Let's go to the one place we can to find the answers. Let's go to Jesus. If there's one thing you take away from this Sunday in seeing Jesus as your Messiah, it's like it's okay to have questions as long as you go to the right place for the answers. That's what I want you to do. And let's just hear it from Jesus himself. Jesus, can we see your ID? Who is this Jesus? That's the first part of our sermon. Verse 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble, who does not fall away, as your NIV 84, on account of me. He's quoting Isaiah. That's why that's the first lesson. This is Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is prophecy and fulfillment. This is God making a promise and God keeping a promise. 
said differently, Jesus is God's promises kept. That's what he is. I don't always keep my promises. I don't know how you are. God never breaks them. Faith is taking God at his word and saying, Lord, you promised. He says, yes, I did, and I will keep that promise to you. That's who your God is. And so now, well, let's say you're in prison. Let's say the Romans are crushing you with taxes. What good is the Messiah? What good is the Messiah if inflation is wrecking my savings and it's melting away before my eyes? What good is the Messiah if my marriage fails? What good is the Messiah if I get sick and die? If my child gets sick and dies? Jesus is the Messiah and he can't take away all the heartache in this world because you live in a veil of tears Not just touched by sin, but just stained. It's not coming out. And that's a hard reality and why some people turn away from the Messiah, the Savior, because they want something different. He does not promise to take care of all of our wants. but He does supply our needs, including the one thing needful. And that is the forgiveness that we so desperately need. Verse 7, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. You've seen Jesus' identification. He passes with flying colors. He's the fulfillment of everything God promised. But now what about John? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Some guy who would tell you what you wanted to hear? That was, he, he's not that. If not, what did you go out to see? Verse 8, a man dressed in fine clothes? Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Who doesn't love a spectacle, right? The 4th of July. Let's see an illusion show, John. Let's see you heal some people. He didn't do that at all. He wasn't afraid to offend people. That's why he ended up in prison. Verse 9, then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. That's quoting Malachi. This is another promise kept. That's what John was. He says, verse 11, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. This is God saying this about John the Baptist. You can't get higher praise, can you? Unbelievable. John is the herald of God. That's who John was. You've seen Jesus' ID. You've heard a glowing identification of John the Baptist. By the way, this is why he's called John the Baptist. Because Jesus calls him that. But now what about you? Verse 11, one more time. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The one thing John the Baptist wanted to see, he never had a chance to. He did not see the reality of the New Testament church. To see the gospel ripping through cultures unabated. Satan has been bound in the spirit, just goes with his word anywhere it wants. 3,000 people in one day, John would have fallen over. That was the result from the Pentecost sermon. It's awesome. And I don't know if you feel that it's so awesome. I don't always. A lot of Christianity can be underwhelming. And yet the gospel is still ripping through cultures around the world. It has over and over again. And don't be deceived. Just because things are slowing down in our culture, it still does. Well, you don't need to pull out your identification and show me your name. I believe you if you just tell me. We want to go a little bit deeper than that, don't we? When I say, who are you? You see, you are fearfully 
and wonderfully made. And that's not a message that you get today. The only thing that was assigned at birth to you was your name. Everything else was knit together in your mother's womb. That's how God made you. And if you are starting to question or doubt God's wisdom in making you, he doesn't make junk. He knew what he was doing. And he gave you exactly the gifts that you need to accomplish his plan for you. Now, I don't know exactly what that plan might be, but he does, and it's kind of fun to watch people open up those gifts as they go through life and see all the good things they can do that God has prepared. You are his child and his creation. Well, that's not where it ends, unfortunately. If I say, who are you? I, I was sitting next to a friend of mine at a ba- basketball game this week. The twins have games all week and I think it was a Tuesday, and I sit down. I was wearing a gray polo shirt, and the guy says, I don't know if you can wear that. I'm like, what, why, what's wrong with the gray polo shirt? And the gray polo shirt was fine, but he says, it really accentuates the gray in your hair. And I said, oh, that, that, isn't that a good friend who could tell you this? And I said, first of all, I have blonde hair. And I don't have much of it either because I, I keep it cut short. And uh, there, is, there is gray in there if you ever want to get close. We'll never, if you're watching online, you will never see a 4K broadcast from Star Bethlehem Lutheran Church. You don't want to see pastor's gray hairs. It doesn't really help. But I think you have to own that, which is where I'm going. There's nothing wrong with having gray hair. I think, I I hope wisdom comes with that gray hair as I get older. I tell people I had five kids, that's why I have gray hair. Jenna has gray hair because she's married to me. (laughs) Well, so I think that Gray hair is not the least of my problems. There are things that are wrong with me that I don't need to share with you because there's things that are wrong with you too. And I think just to be honest about those things, we don't need to have share time here, but we do need to acknowledge that before our God. That's what we do every Sunday when we walk in and we have a corporate confession. As a body of believers, we tell our God, I'm a sinner. And I need help. And that's very difficult to do. But that gets to the heart of who our God is. And why we need a Messiah. Because he came to save me from my sin. Not necessarily everything wrong in the world. And so, I... I want to be clear with people. When we show the love of Jesus to the people around us. With the food pantry or any mission work that we do around the world, or helping ease the burdens of the sinful world, that's just a venue so that I can share that love of Jesus, that he's their savior and forgives their sin. Because my identity doesn't start as being a sinner. It starts as being forgiven. That implies sin. Because when I wake up in the morning, I am a forgiven child of the king. If you start right there, that is an incredible place to start your day. Because you're free to do all the things that God has prepared for you. If you start anywhere else, you're setting yourself up for failure. And possibly confusion. And make no mistake, I wear a lot of hats. But when I start there, then I can say, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a pastor. And I wear a few other hats during the week too. But I can do those well only because I know my place in the kingdom. And I understand the grace of my God and how he showered it on me. Dear friends, you know that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the greatest Savior. And he's the only one that the world truly needs. You know that John was his herald. And you are my fellow forgiven children of the King. Amen. Please stand.
The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed found in your worship folder. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 